let me add my welcome as well. Uh, after the virtual, this is going to do something, isn't it? After the virtual uh, event last time, it's really great to have people at a meeting again. Now, traditionally in CASP, this getting together in person has really worked out well in terms of driving the field for the next couple of years. Just to mention, when we talked about this, we decided not to go fully hybrid because we felt that would be a distraction. It turns out we do actually have seven speakers who are going to speak remotely, but other than that, we're not streaming except to those people. We will, if speakers agree, release the talks afterwards, but not sort of the discussion and stuff like that. So you're not going to be on the record in what you say unless somebody tweets you, and we're not forbidding tweeting. Okay, so uh, let's start. This is what this is a somewhat pompous slide about what CASP is about. We're advancing solutions to the protein folding problem by increasing rigor, transparency, communication, and collaboration. So I've got two corrections to make to this slide that I'll get to in a bit. Interesting. Ah, okay. So who are we? Uh, you already heard from Christoph, and he and I are the founders of CASP. The current organizers, Christoph, Andre, who many of you will be familiar with and is really the, the heart of CASP nowadays, um, Taunston and Meyer, uh, and then these are all ex-organizers who have made contributions, and uh, particularly, of course, Anna, who was really the driving force of CASP for quite a few years and is still sorely missed. Um, CASP is not just about the organizers, big point. It's about the assessors, and so let me acknowledge. Why does it do that? <laughs> I'm from Alice all today. I'm trying to fix the audio for uh, But it, ah, it did change at that time. Okay. So here's, the, here's a list of the previous assessors we've had, and you'll know a lot of these names, and um, they always have played an important part and continue, as you'll see, to play an important part this time. Some people who were... Um, Initially, assessors became organizers, and that's the kind of um, importance that they have in the whole, in the whole process. Ah, uh, so in CAS 14, getting down to tax now, by the way, I'm not going to give you any reveals in this talk. If you want to go back to your email, you can. It's not like last time. I'm not going to put up a new progress curve. Um, we're going back to the traditional way of thing, doing things where you'll hear that in the individual uh, sessions. But I do want to talk a little bit about what we're doing at this time and why we're doing it. So that's what this gets into. So um, we had last time all of these different categories. And what we saw, of course, was that something rather dramatic happened um, in the results. So this is the classical CAS progress curve you're mostly familiar with. Uh, main chain accuracy versus target difficulty each CASP, and last time we saw this huge jump actually from these two lines up to this line here. As you know, this performance was dominated by AlphaFold2 from DeepMind. And suddenly we were in a position where the problem in some sense was solved, and I'll come back to this, but one can argue that these models now are often very close to experiment. In fact, let's look at that. Here's uh, an example of a piece of a model from last time. Uh, stuff going on here, right? Beta strands and turns and so on. Uh, the point of it is that it's a superposition of an alpha fold model in the experiment, and you can see this subatomic accuracy almost everywhere. And what I typically say about this slide is, well, that's typical, uh, a bit of a vague statement. But of course, since I made that, there have been a number of studies of what do you mean by these models are accurate. And I'd like to see, show you one example from a recent paper from Tom Terwilliger and colleagues. Um, and these guys were actually out to say that the models are not so great. Uh, they don't match experiment. But in my mind, at least some of their data show exactly the opposite. So let me explain this slide to you. What they've done here is to take a set of AlphaFold2 models generated by, I think it's the Phoenix pipeline, and binned into C alpha distances. So this is C alphas which are 10 apart, 20 apart, and so on. And for each bin, looked at the median difference in the C alpha, C alpha distances for that bin. And so if you look here, you see that at about 15 angstroms, which is a nice big chunk of structure, right? the difference, median difference, is about 0.25 angstroms. 
there's a reference here which is got by comparing crystal structures of the same protein in different crystal forms. So it's some attempt to measure experimental uncertainty, right? And you can see at the same bin, you're at about 0.1. Now, it's not exactly clear what this means, but the simplest interpretation would be, okay, at this 15 angstrom level, at worst, we've got about a 0.15 average median error, 0.15 angstroms. It gets bigger as you get further away, and I think there's some interesting things to discuss here. But if you're looking at any kind of local detail in a structure, like that slide I showed you just now, that's the sort of accuracy you're talking about. It's really quite extraordinary. So that meant we had to change things in CASP. Last time we were having, for example, an assessor look at protein topology. It's hard to believe whether the fold is right. We had somebody, Nick Grishin, did a very great job at looking at that, but of course, it wasn't much worthwhile because all the folds were right. We had somebody looking at high accuracy modeling as a sort of just about starting to do that, and that's now the whole game. We were looking at protein assemblies. Um, we were also looking at refinement. So this comes from the idea that in the end is something I endorsed very strongly. All of this informatics waffle will not amount to a hill of beans, we'll have to finish the job off with at least physics-inspired methods, and we've been doing that since about 2008. That turned out not to be valid, and so we stopped uh, doing this. Contact prediction, which we've been doing since 1996, uh, because now, of course, it's distance predictions, and anyway, it's embedded often in an end-to-end -end pipeline, so we stopped doing that. We also stopped doing two things to do with data-assisted and function, not really for any good reason, except we couldn't handle the load. This was a lot of reorganization, and hopefully we'll go back to these in future casts. So of the eight things we were doing, we scrapped four of them. It's by far the biggest kind of change we've ever tried to do in cats. By the way, these down the bottom are things that were scrapped in earlier rounds. And what we have now, as you're probably aware, is tertiary structure prediction. There was some debate about this. Do we need to do that? And I think after a moment's thought, it was obvious we do. There are some places where the alpha fold models don't work. There are now alternative deep learning technologies, like the language models, for instance. How well do they work? And just in general, can people come up with alternative approaches? Um, obviously, keeping protein assemblies, again, doing it as we have for a number of casts with Capri, and sort of a no-brainer, because I think everybody expected that this might be where the next successful application of the methods was. And um, we'll see tomorrow that that is in fact true. We've got really spectacular results there. Accurate estimation, I think, is an underrated thing. That idea uh, in the Tom Terwilliger paper that these are only hypotheses, I think, is displaced if you can accurately predict accuracy. If you can compute a structure, say how accurate it is, you have an object which is competitive with an experiment. It's not just a hypothesis. So to me, this has actually acquired new urgency. And then these are three new areas which obviously are right for the picking for deep learning methods. Everybody agrees in principle. RNA structure is something we hadn't done before, and we did this now with RNA puzzles, and particularly with Eric Westhoff, as you know, has been leading puzzles for some time, and we'll hear about that, uh, I guess, on Monday, um, really nice results there, and of course the question is, does leap word learning work or not? And you'll have to wait and see. Protein ligand complexes are something there's been a lot of hype about deep learning, and so uh, there used to be an operation that did that, D3R, like CASP. They went out of business when the NIH dropped their funding, um, so we've moved into this. And finally, ensembles. So for many years we were criticized you're only doing a single structure. Proteins are not single structures, they're ensembles. Um, that turns out to be an interesting challenge in the CASP setting. We'll hear about results of that from the different assessors, and then there'll be a uh, discussion led by Guy Montalioni, uh, I guess Monday night, on what to make of it all. Okay, um, so uh, bottom line, we need to cross out the original title, and now we're going to call it Advancing Solutions in Computational Structural Biology. Maybe that's even more pompous, I'm not sure. Um, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to do. Well, first of all, who are the assessors? 
So uh, protein tertiary structure, we asked Dan, who did refinement assessment last time, to come back because he did such a fantastic job on that and we thought this sort of fine detail stuff we're now into would be appropriate. Uh, protein complexes, we also asked Esti to come back because she did such a great job. Um, and um, protein complexes, again, uh, Mark and Shushana will present uh, Capri's findings. So for this and for puzzles, we've actually got two different assessments um, and you'll hear about those. For RNA, uh, Ariju agreed to be the assessor. It's the first time we've done this, so it's been very interesting activity. And Eric uh, will has done the analysis with his colleagues on RNA puzzles, and so there'll be two assessment talks here. We were lucky to get Pat for protein ligand complexes. Pat works in pharma on drug development, so actually knows what he's talking about here, and has also uh, been an assessor in D3R, so his experience of the assessment business. And then Gabrielle, who works with Tornston, and of course Tornston's group, have done a lot of accuracy estimation work. And so, as you'll hear, Gabrielle has extended the scope of that, especially to include uh, analysis of predictions of accuracy for complexes. Okay. Well, so what are we going to do? So, as always in CAS conferences, the thing revolves around assessment talks and participant talks. Um, there's going to be a session essentially on each of the topics, except we've combined protein structure and assemblies. And we did that because it turned out there was a lot of overlap of the people selected to speak and of the methods they were using. So tomorrow morning, there'll be most of the morning on that. Each of the sessions on assessment and participant talks will be followed by follow-up discussions at some point there isn't often time to ask enough questions in these sessions. So uh, there'll be a longish one tomorrow night on proteins and assemblies, a longish one the night after on RNA, and then other ones scattered throughout the meeting. Um, posters, we're gonna have two poster sessions as we've seen, one after lunch on each of the next two days. Usually posters have been great at CAS because it's somewhere they're gonna be out the back there. You can gather and interact as intensely as you like. The last hour of the meeting is the participants thing. I know you're all going to be running for the airport, but please don't. We can't do CASP unless people take part. And so uh, we really want to hear from you what you liked and didn't like about this round and what you'd like us to do in future. And then we have two overview talks from uh, Jun Jumper and Ming Yung Peng um, on the relationship between deep learning and structural biology, which is, if anything, is the theme of the conference, I guess. And finally, don't forget there's an interesting city out there if you can find the tunnel. Okay. Um, I want to finish up. I skipped something here. I skipped SIG sessions, these special interest group things. And this is something we've tried to do before, and it's never really taken off. And the idea is that we have some kind of community here. Can we get that community to do other things than compete with each other in making predictions? And um, that, I think, acquired new urgency because after what DeepMind did, one of the comments people made was, well, you know, they had all this money, all these computers, all these people. You give me that, I could have done this too. And if you do the numbers, you see that's wrong because um, there were about 50 groups working on this aspect of CASP last time. Two people in the group is 100 people compared to 18 at DeepMind, many of whom were very part-time. And if you add up all those GPUs, you've got you know, at least 50 GPUs, you've got good resources. The reason DeepMind did it and other people didn't, well, there are a number of reasons, but one reason is they were working in a coordinated way that we don't. We're not gonna become a company we're not going to have a CEO who's going to tell everybody what to do. But the idea is, can we advance to a more collaborative kind of thing? Um, so uh, we can sort of skip this, I think. So um, if you score us on what we're doing now, I think we're sort of good at rigor. We ain't bad at transparency, but we're lousy at communication and collaboration. Can we do better at those things? Um, so we've got these five session, sessions in, in parallel, some of them, on the two next days. Um, and uh, what we'd like to come out with is 
clear plans about how we can make this work in the next two years. Not just ideas, but what we're actually going to do. And then there'll be a wrap up on the last morning to discuss that. Um, the emails have sort of laid this out a bit and said um, the sorts of things you might think about doing, so you know, Zoom meetings, journal clubs, um, benchmarking, software, all of that stuff. I'd like it if people would think a bit harder about the best way to do this, particularly as we're sort of an algorithmically biased group. Can we come up with novel ways of going about this that might work? And I want to give you an idea which you might not like, but it's intended to illustrate and provoke you uh, into thinking about your own ideas. So this is about AI methods, and we already know that these methods, we hope, will work on a number of different problems that they haven't worked on so far. So single proteins or shadow alignments, RNA structure, conformational ensembles, and so on and so on. And I don't know about you, but every week, if not every day, something appears on my Twitter feed about a new preprint which is highly relevant to that. And so one can think of uh, this sort of relationship. Oh, the colors are a bit dim, but hopefully you can read it. Uh, where there is, uh, for each of these problems, there are solutions which have been proposed. So for example, for the single protein sequence problem, there is a suggestion that natural language processing, large language models, should work here. And as you know, there are a number of papers on that and um, we've got results in this CASP. Um, you'll see from the results how true that is or isn't at the moment. And, and I don't want to go through all this, but you, you can imagine transfer learning for protein-protein complexes and so on. Um, so uh, we've got these papers on natural language processing which say they can solve this problem. Could you predict, could you have predicted from the papers how those are going to perform in this CASP? Could you have looked at the papers and said, that's, going to, that, that's really it, that's going, to be, that's going to solve the single sequence problem, or, well, I don't quite believe these papers. And one way you could have thought about that is to, so this is now general, here's any method, say language models, here's an application, say single sequences, here's two papers which uh, are relevant to whether this arrow is valid or not. One paper, the color here is intended to uh, indicate that after analysis, there's not a lot of confidence in this, this green one on the other hand, more confident. And those colors are based in turn on looking at particular features in the papers. So they're obvious features. Uh, we all know that training bias can be a problem and indeed in one of the language models has been heavily criticized for training bias. We all know statistical rigor is a problem. We all know benchmark is a problem and so on and so on. The idea is that we can put up a resource where for each new paper, we have categories, and one can argue about these. I'm not saying these are the best categories, but they're the ones we got at the moment, and have people fill in their comments on that under some sort of editorial control so that we'll be able to come up with a ranking of these papers and hence what we know about this sort of application. Now, you may think this is a really terrible idea, but the point of it is it's a different way of trying to look at the problem and what I'd like to urge you is you think of your way of looking at the problem. Uh, okay, I think that is all I want to say. Thanks.